Um, welcome. Um, really, we have Dr. Uh, Matthew Johnson Roberson, who Steve will give an introduction to in just a second. Um, but there are people joining us online, and for those um, who can possibly see, we're actually having our program review right now. So we are joined by um, some of our NOAA colleagues as well as those from um, from industry. So um, welcome to all. My name is Sarah Grassi. I'm the outreach manager for COMIT. And thanks for joining us today for our October webinar. Um, we do have two more to close out 2022. Next month, we'll be having a webinar about high resolution of uh, mapping Arctic sea ice. And then we'll close out um, with our December webinar, um, which was supposed to be a September webinar, but about other plans. Um, so, and that will be about socio ecological functions of nature based coastal protection approaches um, in the chat. I'm going to link to our website, Twitter, um, YouTube page, which has archived webinars as well as um, how you can sign up for our newsletter. And then um, for today's presentation, we'll have time for discussion at the end. So for those joining virtually, please keep yourself on mute for now um, and then you can use the chat feature or um, to ask questions. We'll make sure to keep monitoring that. Um, and then, yeah, so I will hand it over to our director, Steve. Thanks, and uh, um, thank you to our speaker here. So I wanted to give a brief introduction to Dr. Matthew Johnson Roberson. He is a uh, director of the Carnegie Mellon Robotics Institute at Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon Institute in that coastal area of Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania. Um, so um, he's also a professor of, in the in the School of Computer Science there. He received his PhD from University of Sydney in 2010. Um, he's held prior postdoctoral positions, including one at uh, the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, um, and also in, in the Australian Center for Field Robotics. Um, he co-founded uh, a, a, a company called Refraction AI, uh, which does autonomous uh, vehicle delivery uh, uh, things. Um, he's uh, worked in robotic perception since the first early DARPA grant, uh, which was a grand challenge, and its group focuses on enabling robotics to better um, see and understand their environment. So with that, um, very much appreciate um, Dr. Ro Johnson Roberson and take it away. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the invite um, and excited to talk to everybody. Um, uh, I have been at a number of places that are landlocked, but continue to do underwater robotics. I don't know what that tells you about me. Perhaps I'm just stubborn. Um, uh, but University of Sydney was on the water, so that's that's uh, Sydney is, is the one example, counter example. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you today about some uh, sort of examples from uh, what I what we like to call field robotics, I guess, which is sort of the deployment of robotic systems. I'm going to focus uh, for this audience on the underwater stuff, um, but lots of the same technology that kind of underlies this uh, works in ground vehicles, self-driving cars, and aerial vehicles, and other fun stuff. Um, but we're going to talk mostly about um, deep learning and mapping as applied to underwater vehicles. Um, so I've been really lucky. I've been able to work on a number of really, really cool robot platforms over the years. Uh, probably the um, more recent platforms we've been using are AUVs, uh, autonomous underwater vehicles that look like these. So these are sort of torpedo shaped AUVs. These are ones that I was using at the University of Michigan prior to coming here at CMU uh, a little while ago. And you know we've done a number of different things with them, but I'm gonna go just run through some of the sort of field applications and some of the type of data we're able to gather with it, and where I think sort of the science applications of that have been. Um, so these vehicles were deployed for a marine archaeology project that we did on the southern coast um, of the Peloponnese in Greece. And so this was a project looking at a city that had submerged, um, a Bronze Age city that had been submerged for uh, a couple thousand years, and at this point um, it was just off the coast. Um, sea level rise due to kind of um, tectonic plate shift is what they believe had submerged it and, and then you know it kind of just sat there it was discovered in the 1960s but then sort of left alone and so this was sort of one of the first expeditions back to take uh high resolution samples and so for us this was one of the first development projects to for allow us to understand how robots could be used in sort of the marine archaeological context 
to really understand and map sites at, at high resolution. So what you see there in red is what we did with a kind of robotic rig pushed by divers. And what you see in blue there is what we did with those torpedo shaped AUVs I showed in the last slide. And really this was done over two years and the goal was to try to enhance and sort of augment what people were able to do by hand. So if you see over on the right there, that's an archeological plan drawn by hand using survey equipment in the water, which is really the primary way that marine archeology span um, uh, was being done and, and in many ways was still, is still being done, um, which is obviously very laborious and, and, and quite tough. And so what we wanted to do from a technology perspective is show how kind of AUVs could enable marine archeology span to cover much larger areas with much greater resolution. So what we assembled, which was the largest sort of 3D reconstruction of its kind from marine archaeology at the time, we took 200,000 stereo pairs and using a process called simultaneous localization and mapping, assembled those into um, one large scale 3D reconstruction. And so there's sort of the overview of it. Uh, uh, those um, you can see the uh, sort of scale markers down there on the bottom, but the but the ultimate you know, final resolution of it, you can see there's a scale marker down there for about half a meter. You can see each individual stone and rock across at this resolution across the whole site, which we think is a really important tool. It just would simply be, you'd be unable to do without a robot or kind of robot aided technologies. It's sat down there. If you ever get a chance to go, it's just off the coast. Uh, you can actually uh, snorkel on it and see it incredibly well. Uh, it is being buffeted by the effects of climate change. So, you know, maybe go now uh, before it's gone. Um, you know, I've also been really lucky to be able to work with a number of other partners that work on other large scale um, marine vehicles. So uh, this is a vehicle run out of URI. Um, uh, and what we did with this was again, the same type of 3D reconstruction approaches. This was for a, a shipwreck in Southern Turkey. Uh, or off the coast of southern Turkey. And so it was a wooden ship. Uh, obviously, all the wood gets dissolved um, over time, and all that was left with a clay amphora. So, what you see here are the amphoras that would hold wine or grain. Um, and you'll see as I um, uh, change a slide here that we not only gather imagery of it, but that's a 3D relief map of that same data. And then you can kind of zoom all the way in and see the level of fine detail we're able to gather on those kind of amphoras. And so you can see actually lines that were uh, etched into the pots. Um, and a little starfish hanging out there over on the left hand side. Uh, you know, so we got to do lots of fun uh, diving alongside the robots when they're in shallow water, but it really helped us sort of think with marine scientists about how they would use some of this technology to augment what they already do. So as opposed to trying to replace them, thinking about ways of giving them tools. And so this is an example of a diver push set of tools. There's LED flashes out there on the edges, uh, a pair of stereo cameras facing down, and then GPS when you're on the surface. Um, and so again, you know, thinking about how to use these tools along with kind of software packages to allow for large scale 3D reconstruction. Again, another uh, partner institution of ours, Woods Hole, uh, has a sentry vehicle, and we we're able to put stereo cameras, downward facing stereo cameras on that. So it's a deep water uh, stereo camera rig um, with associated strobes um, to bring illumination. And with those, we're able to do these large scale 3D reconstructions off the Western continental shelf of the United States. And so what you're gonna see here again is over kind of hundreds of meters, 3D reconstructions we're able to do, you know, and this was uh, in the context of, of a NASA project looking at, you know, proxies for space exploration. And so one of the things that I think is really, really cool is when you're able to use these 3D reconstructions, right, you get a sense of relief. And so those are mounds that are created by um, uh, bacterial upwellings. And you can see that we not only have, I guess, the imagery over that large scale area, but also the 3D relief, which again, I think brings context and helps for the scientific understanding. Um, in that same project, we did a, a larger scale um, set of uh, uh, reconstructions. And so this is one looking at bacterial mats and you can see bacterial mats was zoomed in here. Again, in the context of this NASA project, thinking about sort of the future of space exploration and using the limited communication and kind of great depth um, uh, in these environments as a, as a good proxy for how we would look for life on other planets. As I'll skip ahead here, you can see that I think it looks kind of like Mars. Um, uh, and as you see kind of the 3D relief and um, uh, kind of cool stuff. And again, you know, most of the work we've been focused on is, has been benthic work. And now we're pushing mostly into much more deep water environments. So we're really focused on thinking about ways of enabling deep water um, uh, 3D reconstruction as opposed to um, places where you can do this with other technologies. Okay, so uh, I promised to talk about deep learning in this. And so how does this relate to machine learning and deep learning approaches, right? 
so quick refresher on deep learning. Uh, the technology is sort of advanced in quite a number of ways. Uh, you may be seeing in the news recently, lots of stuff about generative models, um, but certainly in robotics, one of the most uh, influential kind of ways that we use deep learning has been um, thinking about object identification or classification. So, you know, uh, you can train a network to tell you where the bird is or the frog is or a person or a car or a helmet. Uh, how does that work? Well, you pass some training images in to a large network that have labels and then uh, you kind of uh, train over some period of time by refining the weights to make those predictions. And then at inference time, you give it some novel image you've never seen before, and it tells you it's a truck or a bird or a cat or whatever. Great, great. Okay, so how does this work in practice? Well, it requires these massive amounts of human labels typically to do that task well. And so what you see here um, are images that come from the self-driving domain where somebody has gone through by hand and labeled every pixel and said, great, all the pixels in blue are cars, all the pixels in purple are sidewalk, all the per, per, whatever pixels in green are trees. And that can take hours per image. And it requires these huge farms of human labelers to achieve those sort of aims. And so from our perspective, it seems like that is probably uh, not the future, right? Uh, so the question is, how do we get away from that? And lots of sort of where uh, the robotic industry has been focused on the deep learning problems has been in getting massive labeled data sets and then thinking about how to use them. So if you're familiar with the sort of uh, genesis of a lot of these image recognition techniques, they come from a thing uh, called ImageNet, which was a big, massive data set of labeled images to solve these problems. But what I would argue is there's a big divide between that and what we have in the sort of marine domain, which is lots of vehicles that are gathering lots of data, but certainly in no ways the size and volume of data sets that have human labels that you would see in an example like something like ImageNet. Okay, so robots, great. How do I escape this labeling problem? And so, you know, uh, my group and others have kind of put forward a number of different approaches to this, but I'm gonna focus on a few here just to tell you about sort of where I think the field is going. So one is self-supervision or unsupervised learning. So mechanisms that allow you to do this without massive amounts of training data, I think provide an important role in where we're going here. Uh, the next is physics, right? Physics is unchanging. It is a thing that will persist uh, and is consistent uh, across time. And so that's another way of enforcing some constraints that you may be able to learn from. And then the final one is simulation, which uh, we're not gonna talk about here, but I think is another really important avenue. Great. Uh, so starting with underwater image physics, this is work done by two former graduate students of mine, uh, Catherine Skinner, uh, Katie's now an assistant professor at the University of Michigan, and Jee Lee, who's now a research scientist at Toyota Research Institute. A uh, quick refresher on uh, imaging in the water column. So water column imaging uh, has a very nice and well understood uh, set of physics associated with it. And we're just going to go over really, really quickly. Essentially what happens is as light comes out of your light source and passes through the water column, right, it gets attenuated based on its frequency. So red light gets attenuated uh, more quickly than other types of light, but it is all based on sort of the frequency of the light uh, that gets absorbed and then gets reflected off the thing you're looking at. So in this case, the benthos, it bounces back um, and we know what the scattering of that looks like. There's then scattering that happens on the back pass. And then finally it gets to your camera. And if your camera is in a dome viewport, um, uh, that means that there's a translation uh, of the rays from water to air, back to, or water to glass, back to air. Uh, and you know you can think about these things for flat or for dome viewport, it's great. Uh, there's some lensing effects, there's some absorbed photons, there's a digital response to the camera, uh, but we'll, we won't worry about any of that for the moment. What we try to approach here were ways of thinking about doing this without having to uh, take large amounts of labeled data of what you're seeing in the water column with ground truth about what the actual in-air data would look like, right? That's a really, really hard problem. We don't have those type of labels for the underwater environment. And so uh, what Katie and G deployed here was an approach called WaterGAN, which is gonna use a generative adversarial network, which is one of these generative models that's attempting to produce um, novel images. But in this case, it's doing that using the physics we know from underwater image formation to produce images as if they were taken underwater and then create another network that then inverts those physics to then give us an image. In air to an image as if it looks like it's underwater. 
Uh, great. Well, the way that GANs work is pretty uh, simple, actually, in practice. So there's two networks. There's a generator network and a discriminator network. The generator network takes some input, could be random vector of some form, and generates fake data. Uh, then a discriminator network says, oh, is this fake or is it real? Looking at some real data that it has, has that doesn't have to be labeled, but just that you know it's real. And then it iterates between these two networks. So the network, the generator network uses gradient descent to get better at making fake data, and the discriminator network also uses gradient descent to get better at telling the difference between real and fake. And by alternating between these two training regimes, you end up with two networks, one that's really, really good at making fake data, and the other one that's really good at telling the difference. Well, in the context of the underwater imagery, we don't really care about telling the difference between fake and real data, but we do really want a generator network that can produce very realistic underwater data using um, uh, this information. And so what we have is in air, RGB images, but also depth maps because those are easier to gather in air than they are underwater because you can use things like time of flight or RGBD cameras that have uh, depth for every pixel. And then we use the physics we know from the underwater uh, imaging domain, things like backscattering, the attenuation, the camera model, and all of those things to then produce images synthetically that look like they were taken underwater, right? And the way that we get better at that is by training a discriminator against real underwater images that come from the domain we're in currently. So if we deploy the robot, we don't need to label those images. We just need to gather images from the real underwater environment. And then we have samples for which to learn the specific coefficients of the physics model we're using here in this context. Um, so uh, without belaboring the details, there's an attenuation step, a backscattering step, et cetera. And we do all of that to produce these synthetic underwater images that are matching the physics of what we're seeing in our real underwater data. Great. Once we have that, why is that useful? Well, we now have something that we can invert to produce a color restored image as if it were taken in air. So we take that um, set of networks that gave us the physics for this synthetic underwater data, and we use that to invert that to then restore the color back as if it were taken in air using another uh, deep learning network. Great, we did this both in the field and also in some lab setups. So we submerged an artificial rock platform with a color chart so we could get some uh, quantitative data on how well this works. Stereo camera, underwater stereo camera system there on the left. And we tested it, uh, this system in pure water. Oh, oh, I'll take the play there. So you can see here on the left, uh, the very typical images you would see underwater, which are incredibly green uh, with some scattering effects. And you can see the restored imagery over there on the right. Um, that reflects the sort of grayness of the rocks and the brownness of the bottom. Great. Uh, you can look at this again because we had color board data uh, quantitatively. So significant improvements in RG and B in the restored approach. Uh, we compared it to a bunch of other techniques that are out there in the literature. Uh, if you're interested, I would highly recommend having a look at the water game paper. Um, yeah. Great. Okay. So one of the things that falls out of this is the fact that you can estimate the depth of the image from a singular monocular um, data source, uh, which is great because something about the attenuation is telling you how far away objects are in your scene. So we take that to another level by saying, okay, well, look, we have this physics-based model of light propagation in water. One of the things that we can do is use that and this idea of self-supervision and the geometry constraints that come from that to train another network to estimate uh, depth, but in this case, from stereo imagery. Great. So we call this network underwater stereo net. And what it does is it takes raw stereo images. It has a depth estimation module that produces a disparity map, which is the shift or the parallax that exists between the left and the right image, right? And the one thing we have here, we know self-supervision, we have these geometric constraints. Because the cameras are calibrated to each other, we know how an object in the left should appear in the right, depending on its depth. And so that we can then produce this estimate and then cross check by warping from one image to the other and improve the consistency of that without having to have any ground truth labels, just by looking at the visual consistency of the left and right disparity maps. And so again, you know, this is another mechanism we think that allows you to get away from hand labels and move towards a uh, approach that's self-supervised. We have a color correction module that's attempting to address the same uh, attenuation yeah. issues that I showed you from the previous set of slides. Uh, and the idea here is that all that works together to produce color corrected stereo images that are both uh, appear as if they were taken in air and also have very accurate depth estimates. Great. Uh, so there are two 
uh, networks that run in parallel that have the exact same set of weights. And they, again, estimate the left and right disparity images. If you're interested in the details, um, uh, we're having a look at the paper. Uh, but ultimately, they do a set of 3D convolutions to produce these disparity maps directly from those stereo images. Uh, and then the loss function, or how we calculate how accurately they are estimating this, is looking at the warping from the left to the right and vice versa. Great. Uh, we took this out to the Bermuda Institute of Ocean Sciences uh, and ran it on a diver rig as opposed to a robot. Uh, and then took a blue ROV and equipped that again with the same set of stereo cameras and took that on a rock and color board setup. And you can see here uh, in the imagery, there's the raw imagery on the left, the depth map with green being closer to the camera and red being further away, and then the color corrected imagery over there on the right. And so you can see sort of in this dense coral field that we're able to not only just correct the color imagery, but also produce this really accurate 3D depth estimate of what we're seeing. Great. Okay. Uh, if you compare that to sort of other ways that you can go about doing this, uh, uh, this approach produces uh, a much lower mean error. Great. Uh, and here's just some more results comparing it to other color correction methods. Okay. So, uh, sort of shifting gears, but staying in the same vein, you know, uh, as we've been thinking about perception, sort of the next natural step for us was thinking about how you would use that kind of rich perception data to do underwater manipulation. So what you're gonna see here is less data from survey vehicles and more from ROVs. And so uh, this is Gideon, he's actually now since graduated uh, uh, from the University of Michigan. Uh, and he's been really interested in uh, trying to solve this problem. So this is an ROV doing a uh, core sample here by uh, human. So this is a human running the arm, taking that sample, plunging it into the uh, sediment, and then bringing it back and putting it in the tool tray, right? So the question we had is how much of this can be automated because that's an incredibly laborious process that requires uh, both quite a lot of focus from the ROV pilot, but also a lot of cost and expense associated with ROV piloting. So he's been working on a number of different techniques, but uh, I'll highlight one which he calls silo net, which is interested in estimating the six degree of freedom pose from RGB images. And so again, this is, this is RGB data, RGB, data and he is interested in figuring out the pose of those samples uh, so that he can grab and manipulate them in an ROV context. Um, so why is this an important estimation problem for robots? Well, you want to pick things up if you're working in an Amazon warehouse. If you are an AUV or an ROV, you may want to interact with things like soil samples. You may want to work in structured environments, also useful for things like augmented reality. So he's going to start in air because this is a hard problem. And so he started with a set of pose detection challenges in air. And so these are all uh, configurations of objects that he wants to figure out the pose of to grab and manipulate in air. But one of the real, real challenges with this is underwater, we're not going to have the depth data that comes from an RGBD camera, which is obviously typically used in air. And so for underwater vehicles, embedded systems, outdoor systems, right, we want to eliminate that depth data and do this just with kind of images that would come off something like a cell phone or a normal RGB camera. Uh, so he created this approach called SiloNet, where he looks for the silhouettes, predicts the silhouettes of these objects, and then uses that through another neural network to predict the 3D object pose. So here's a block diagram of how that all works in practice, but ultimately what he does is he renders a bunch of viewpoints of the object, extracts the silhouettes from those, and then passes them through another neural net that is trying to estimate directly translation and rotation of those objects. Okay, but this is underwater talk, so where are we gonna go with that? Well, he wanted to then take that approach and apply it to the underwater domain. So what he's gonna do here is six degree of object pose estimation in fisheye imagery that is much more relevant from the ROV context, right? So one of the big problems we have with manipulating things underwater is that uh, it's often hard to see stuff when you get your arm really close to it because a narrow field of view camera, particularly one in the hand, uh, has just a very limited field of view when it comes to grasping and manipulating objects. Great. So fisheye cameras are increasingly being applied in robotics. What you can see here is some ROV data from a fisheye camera. So there are a couple things in that that we'll talk about. One, you're going to see some fiducial markers. So those barcode-like things, those are not being used for the grasping manipulation. Those are used to ground truth this, but making the problem much easier by saying, oh, well, we have a fiducial marker, so we have some ground truth from the underwater context. He takes that fisheye imagery, which you can project onto a sphere, and then you can always unwarp into a sort of uh, rectangular projection uh, environment in which you try to remove the distortions induced by this really wide field of view. 
So ultimately, the, the central problem that he's trying to deal with is these large distortions that exist in the extrema of the images makes it very, very difficult to estimate the pose directly in those image frames. And so this sort of large ambiguity and distortion uh, means that as you move from the center projection of those lenses to the extrema of them, right, you see massive distortions in the way that things appear, which would obviously distort the way that you think about the pose of those objects and where they are in the environment. Okay, so uh, he wants to directly regress the orientation of these objects to their apparent viewpoint in the scene. So we're gonna have an arrow there, which is the fisheye's optical axis. So that is the center of projection of the fisheye lens. There's gonna be a spherical image that exists around that, right? And that's in this case, a, a virtual image, right? But that's the field of view that the lens is seeing. And there's a fisheye's viewpoint, which points in the direction that the lens is facing. The problem we're interested in solving is that T handle there, which is gonna be on the end of the thing you use to take soil samples or grab things, right? Has some rotation and some X, Y, and Z position in space. And we'd like to estimate that relative to the arm to be able to grab it and manipulate it. Okay, excellent. So what he works on here is directly estimating, right, the apparent viewpoint of where that object appears in the scene in a virtual image, which gives us this virtual optical axis, which we can then use to calculate the relative position of the actual position of that relative to the camera. So this virtual optical, virtual optical axis, right, can be calculated by thinking about the intersection of it with this spherical image, which is represented by those two equations there. And then we can think about how to then adjust the rotation of whatever we are observing to this virtual optical axis, which ultimately gives us the relative pose of this object in the camera's uh, frame. Great. Okay, so how does this work in practice, right? Well, so the baseline approach he took is just say, well, let's just unwarp the image uh, using a standard unwarping technique and then estimate this and directly regress translation and orientation. He then thought about doing that projectively. And then finally, in this perspective case, which ultimately is what he settled on, right? We can in, then hopefully in real time, directly estimate the pose of these things without having to go through this unwarping process and hopefully reducing ultimately the error uh, accumulated. Okay, so he produced a data set here, which is maybe of interest if you kind of work in this space where he used the fiducial tags in here to get ground truth by using uh, an approach called simultaneous localization and mapping, doing what we're, we're, he called tag slam, and then finding the six degree of freedom poses of all the objects there. Okay, so can we use these ultimately to do underwater manipulation? That's the goal here. So he looked at two different sets uh, of data. One, the woods hole handles, which were kind of pretty standard T handles that had uh, a lot of specular reflections, which made them difficult to deal with. And then over there on the right, the uh, Schmidt Ocean Institute handles, which were a little bit different, different arm, um, et cetera. Great. So here you can see uh, camera data coming back from the real system. Um, and those uh, uh, axes uh, drawings over there on the right show you the relative position of the arm uh, to those targets in the data set that he used, right? So this is just for ground truth. This is what he was using to be able to figure out if we're doing this well. Great, so this is his system uh, trying to augment that, right? And so here you can see the reprojection of the 3D models of those pose handles back into the scene. And so you can see that if you're estimating those pose handle positions well, you're gonna be able to then figure out where they sit relative to your camera's position um, very, very accurately. Okay, great. And so you can see as the camera moves around, right, the relative positions of those 3D models in that highly distorted imagery, um, he's able to still estimate. Okay. Great. So then this is the whole system working together. What you see there in the three images over there on the right are the dynamic real-time estimates of those T handles. Um, in the image frame relative to the arm, which can then be used for grasping manipulation. So you can see this in a couple of different environments here, right? But you can see that the ROVs there sitting on the bottom, those T handles that are there on the benthos, he has those fiducial markers for ground truth, but bear in mind, right, those are not being used to estimate those things over there on the right. Those are just there to show, um, to know how accurately he is doing that. So in the real deployment, you wouldn't have those fiducials uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, and the hope is to be able to do this all um, closed loop in real time. Great. 
Awesome. Okay, so where is this all going? Where are we hoping to take this? Well, where he's trying to move here, right, is the automated manipulation of things from an ROV um, in real time, right? So the idea here is autonomous grasp manipulation, the pick and place problem as we would call it terrestrially, but doing that underwater. So this is a really, really hard problem. And so he started in air. So you can see here a setup that he had at Woods Hole, which was trying to do this with the camera that's sitting there on the arm. Um, you can see standing off uh, the end effector there with a bunch of T handles and a uh, box with another type of handle on it here in air. Okay, so uh, his ultimate goal, right, was to do this in water though, right? So he was able to mount stereo cameras here on the vehicle and then have a fisheye camera wrist mounted on the end effector um, uh, of the RV's arm with the ultimate goal of bo doing both stereo reconstruction, right? So lots of the techniques we were talking about before, thinking about how do I do this 3D reconstruction in real time, doing all of that, doing it underwater, and then using that information to, in conjunction with the T-handle estimation, to grab things, to avoid running into stuff, and to pick and place or to take samples autonomously, closed loop um, in this environment. Okay, so the first task, right, is to do this 3D reconstruction. And so those stereo cameras were used to do dynamic 3D reconstruction in real time in the underwater context. And you can see virtual, a virtual version of the arm over there on the left, and then a real 3D construction, 3D reconstruction there uh, with the T-handles in it uh, uh, in the kind of center. Right, the fisheye camera is there to do the object detection and visual servoing to bring the arm in to actually make the graphs on the T-handles to take samples to do whatever else you need to do. And then he put fiducials both on the arm and on these to be able to ground truth whatever he's doing. Uh, he was working on the Nereid under ice vehicle, another Huey vehicle. And this has some interesting dynamics that make this a much harder problem, uh, you know, uh, from a grass manipulation standpoint, the Nereid under ice vehicle has these doors that open up that have their cameras on them and the arm that sits on these doors. And so as opposed to being rigidly mounted to the frame of the ROV, they sit uh, on these doors. And so their relative position relative to the body frame of the ROV changes. Uh, so, you know, uh, it's never to make the problem too easy. He then looked at trying to do this. And so you can see a uh, 3D model over there on the right of uh, the doors and the ROV and the arm, you can see the kinematic chain of those relative to uh, the vision frame in the center. And then you can see the real data that I was using to ground truth this over there on the left. Okay. So uh, he tried out the Gen 1 tag mounts there on the left. Uh, there were some challenges with that. So he got better and the Gen 2 tag mounts were there on the right. But bear in mind, right, his ultimate goal here is to do the following. He wants to, uh, take the ROV's arm that sit out on the doors to then plan a path to grab a T-handle and move it to a new location to take a sample. And so you can see he's manipulating where he wants the T-handle's ultimate position to be over there on the right, and then asking the robot to execute that to move the T-handle from its current position there. So the robot's kinematic chain and everything else about the arm is done all autonomously. And so once he selects where we would like the arm to go, it figures out the inverse kinematics and all of the uh, uh, movements necessary to execute that command. And so ultimately, this is where we're hoping to go, right? This is the goal here is not necessarily to replace humans in sort of the um, gathering of science data, but uh, in, in a way to make it much more interactive, much easier, and much less of a manual process. So a scientist could come in and look and say, I need to take a sample there, and as opposed to having have the ROV pilot who's an expert, spend the time and energy and mental focus to execute that, you can make it as simple as sort of a uh, click or plug and play environment to do those kind of things. Great, uh, so the ultimate goal here was to do this with field demonstrations. And so the first thing you're gonna see, this is on the Schmidt Ocean Institute Sebastian ROV vehicle. This is the real time 3D estimate. So you can see how challenging it is to do 3D reconstruction underwater. You can see sort of the noisy 3D reconstruction we're getting in real time from the vehicle um, when deployed. So that's the 3D reconstruction and you can see the arm moving around in that environment. And again, you can notice the noise as you get to the kind of extreme of the scene, but really the real key here is to note that like, you know, this can be done now in real time, right? Like you can do real time 3D reconstruction from stereo cameras. You can do the real time uh, kinematic estimation of where an arm is and you can get to the point where, you know, um, doing this uh, underwater intervention or manipulation is really something that is possible. 
Okay, so that's just the 3D reconstruction part. So let's put all this together. You can see the vehicle over there. You can see the, uh, this is a slurp gun that was taking slurp samples. And you can see it being commanded to then move around and take those samples. And you can see the 3D model of the arm matching up with uh, what is happening, right? So the ultimate goal here is to do all of this um, without having to have an expert ROV pilot in the loop. And so the last thing I'm gonna show you is sort of we work together with a natural language uh, researcher to put all this together into one complete system. So the final system says uh, in natural language, go to the sample location, right? So you can do that with typing or with voice and then uh, execute now, right? And so that gets processed into the natural language system to convert into an ROV, a set of ROV commands. And so the ultimate goal here, right, is to be able to imagine scientists talking to this system and saying, you know, you know, whatever, stow the arm and have the arm come back. And so you can see in the camera imagery, the real arm, you can see the 3D model of the arm over there on the right, and then the natural language commands being executed over there on the left. So uh, lots of work still to be done, um, but what we've been trying to do is kind of show proof of concept here and continue to develop the system um, with the hope ultimately of getting to the point where lots of this could work, hopefully closed loop. Uh, okay. Uh, that's all I have for slides. So I'm happy to take questions uh, and I have a bunch of backup slides. I can go into more detail on any of the things that we already talked about. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Very interesting presentation and really kind of cutting edge stuff. Um, I'm wondering if we have some questions from either the in-person or the online audiences. I'm from online. Oh, um, I'll tell you what, while you're bringing that up, I have one. Um, so really appreciate that. Um, uh, the first part of your presentation was uh, a lot about um, the the interplay between the attenuation of, of uh, various light spectra and the uh, identification, you know, from optical images. And so many, many of the problems we have in the in the semi tropical world are that it's not only um, light attenuation with depth, but the, the turbidity of the water yeah. itself. And so I'm wondering if there's analogs from the optical world that might be in the acoustic world, you know, in mm -hmm. terms of, you know, uh, doing the same kind of image identification and manipulation. Yeah, totally. So, you know, uh, I think it is the sort of application of deep learning in the acoustic domain is sadly kind of evolving slower because there hasn't sort of been as much attention as there is just because images you know google and facebook and everybody else want you to be able to identify your cat so there's become big pushes in the image domain but the fundamentals of the sort of uh approaches and technology i think are, re are there so you know i've seen two things one right is that there's a lot of really um, good and sophisticated work that's being done in, in by acousticians and others right to continue to develop better imaging systems that uh, try to address lots of the issues with turbidity in the water and, and other challenges. But I have seen um, more recently lots around sort of deep learning based identification uh, techniques on acoustic wow. imaging. Everything from side scan to multi beam to synthetic aperture, you know, really, really across the board. And, and the underlying approaches are, are, are really similar in the sense that um, if you have a large and extensive training set, the problem is really solved. So if you have tons of label examples, um, you can do this now in real time very reliably. I think the larger, more interesting research questions is when you don't. And so uh, lots of people are thinking about how do you use really, really small amounts of labeled data um, to then be able to recognize uh, targets you've never seen before. So that can be everything from shipwrecks to, you know, the Navy wants to look for mines to, um, you know, pipelines to geological features for um, you know, um, marine geologists to uh, different type of um, sediment and, and other kind of backscatter properties for all kinds of other applications. So um, that's progressing a lot. You know, I think again, where, where some of the interesting research questions are, are around how to do it with small amounts of labeled data. Um, but if you're an oil and gas company and you can pay lots of money to get somebody to label it, great, solve problem. Uh, so all of us scientists over here are, are messing around with um, much smaller budgets and much smaller data sets. But the, I would say that the, the classification technology is really there now. Uh, yeah. 
one, one of the reasons I asked that question is, uh, uh, so I'm a fish guy. So uh, instead of having a fixed target on the bottom, you sure. actually have um, a moving target from a moving platform in murky water. So sure. that's probably the, the wickedest problem you could think of. <laughs> yeah. No, but I've seen really great work on on um, uh, 3D sonar data in uh, also in time and then classification of uh, sort of fish schools all the way down to the county level. And then uh, certainly on the optical side, we've done lots with um, baited uh, trap cameras and sort of um, fish farming operations that want to do uh, even identification down to the individual level, right? So if you have a colony of fish that are hanging out around your baited trap, you know, they've gotten good enough now to be able to say that's that's the fish Fred, that's the fish Sally, and and I can, you know, continue to recognize how often they come by. And and certainly more than even fish, other kind of large marine mammals, all that kind of fun stuff. Fred goes goes to the slaughterhouse, right? <laughs> Question from my life. Yeah, so there was a question um, about whether there's any potential for collaboration with FathomNet for non benthic imagery, which is an Ambari um, product. Yeah, yeah. So we know the FathomNet people. Um, uh, my old lab uh, at Sydney has another uh, competing network called Squiddle. And, and what I understand from where that all is, is that several, there was just a big workshop in Europe whose name escapes me like a couple months ago, uh, but all those sort of different organizations are trying to figure out how to create portability between um, the label sets from those different sort of inputs. So um, the Squiddle folks have been working sort of in the Australia, Asia region. Uh, I, know, I know the FathomNet people and they've been doing obviously lots of great stuff over in Bari. And I know they're all talking to each other and kind of export. And we, we have a, a mm -hmm. NOAA project um, that's kicking off right now. And, and they're really interested in figuring out if, um, again, sort of these labels and other things can be put in there. The the central problem, uh, again, just to my mind, is, is definitely not the, I think the systems are, are getting much better. And it's really the sparsity of labels we have, right? So even if you think about midwater column stuff, fish, everything else, you know, um, and, and, and FathomNet and other things are going towards this, you know, some scientist in their lab does the hard work to label some data, and then they put it up on FathomNet, that is great. Um, but we still have, you know, you know, the uh, the data sets in like a self-driving context will be on the order of hundreds of millions of labeled images. And we often are talking in the 50 to 100 range. And so in, in the marine context, and so it's a, still a really challenging, um, I think, problem for the field. And so I think we need to think about how do we want to work, particularly with if we're talking about visual data, um, how do we want to work with that to figure out ways of getting, you know, lots of other things we were talking about, getting away from having to have um, a significant number of labels? Because I just think it, we're, we're never going to get there, right? We're just the the economic uh, um, imperatives to label a hundred million fish images or you know jellyfish image or whatever uh, are, are just are they're not there, and so. Um, not that I don't think they should be, uh, but we have to figure out how to work with, I think, the constraints that the science community has. And so I think that there's some real interesting research questions to be answered there. You know, one of the uh, potential applications that, um, I've talked about with my my colleagues in the uh, survey at uh, mm. at are are here um, is they create massive amounts of um, multi beam sonar imagery. Mm -hmm. and interested in object detection, for example, like where is there an underwater piling, which is a, yep. a, a, a uh, uh, constraint to na uh, safe navigation? And can you automate the process of, of uh, potential hazard identification in these yeah. sort of amounts of data? Um, yep. You might comment on, on that as an enterprise. Yeah, no, no. I, look, the 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 ability to do pretty powerful identifying classification, particularly for multi-beam, is, is, is really good. And so I think what it really comes down to is, is um, figuring out, yeah, uh, how to look at that data and either do one of two things, either again, have enough samples of whatever you're interested in finding and other examples of it that you can, you can do it in a supervised way, 
and, and probably more importantly, one of the kind of open research areas that I think is really useful for us to think about the marine context is this idea of sort of uh, recognition of novelty or identification of something unusual, right? So if you're looking down with a multi-beam, you're mostly looking at sediment, right? Uh, nothing super interesting. Maybe there'll be a few things down there, but and, and the ability to filter through that data and automatically recognize what should be flagged for human review, even if it's just for human review, that is a huge set of tools that I think is really important for us to have because uh, I, as I'm sure any of your graduate students could speak to, if you just stare at the data that comes back from any underwater vehicle, you're mostly looking at nothing, right? It's just a lot of nothing. And uh, if you're looking for a piling or a shipwreck or whatever, and you're looking at mostly mud and sand, um, uh, I would love to save uh, many grad student long nights and think about how do we filter that for, for automatic review. Yeah, actually, you got a few smiling faces here. Of people, <laughs> very good. Um, so this is a question about the the first um, part of your talk about that color uh, rectification work. So yeah. do you all test to see sort of at approximately what altitude above, um, like off the bottom, that that is not usable anymore and then at yeah. different yeah. levels? Yeah, yeah. So um, the challenge for you know the optical imaging obviously is is sort of what's sort of max altitude um we nominally run those most so even the archaeology robots the uh, those big three reconstructions that i showed you those range anywhere between sort of one one and a half meters to in the sort of large scale rov context maybe five or six um there's several japanese rovs that they've been running in in, in clear really really deep water and they'll get up to sort of eight or nine meters. You know, it's the same as if you were diving, right? You know, the visibility obviously varies uh, quite significantly. Um, we're doing a lot of work to work on trying to address the challenges of turbidity and backscatter in the water. So, you know, you can do a lot from a geometry perspective. And so uh, if you're building one of these systems, moving the light sources as far away from the cameras as possible helps quite a bit, right? So if you have a camera here and your light source here, your light source fires and then all of that backscatter comes directly back into the camera that's bad so the further away you can move the light sources from the thing obviously you're li limited by the physics like well the physical model of whatever your vehicle is but a lot of that work is trying to design away um, the challenges of, of turbidity and, and maximize visibility then the second thing that we're starting just starting to get into in our graduate student looking at now right if you think about moving through time right you're taking a number of different images looking downward and uh, the photons that are getting, that are hitting things in the water column and causing the backscatter, which is eliminating your ability to see to the bottom, that's a stochastic process, right? So not every single photon is going to hit something in the water column and come back. And so as you move through time and you move through space, the more you can accumulate information about what um, is coming back from a photon perspective, the more of the sort of removal of that that you can do, right? You're still not going to be anywhere near what you can do with acoustics, obviously, because the physics are really, really different. But so we, we, we are looking at that problem, trying to do whatever we can for image restoration. Uh, color is an important part of that. Most of that work in the archaeological context and in the uh, tropical marine context is in fairly clear water. And so that obviously buys you a lot. Uh, so, you know, uh, if you're interested in optics, my first suggestion is study your problem that can be done in in, in tropical or semi-tropical or, or whatever, or really deep, right? That's the other place that you see um, really great clarity. So a lot of the RV work or AV work we've been looking at is, is, is trying to do studies in, in super deep water where you have much less um, turbidity just because it tends to be much less dynamics in the um, sort of marine context. But, uh, wow. Sorry, long answer. One meter to six meters uh, is typically what we see. Um, hopefully, that helps. And does that? This is going to show my ignorance in this field, but does that um, also work best with a ninety-degree image, or can you also do it with something that's like more at a thirty to forty-five degree angle? Any? Does that have any bearing on that? Message? No, that's a great. That's a great question. No, so I mean. Uh, sort of all these techniques can be done on sort of these varying fields of view. The greater the uh, field of view, typically the higher distortion. And so the more work you need to do to re restore imagery that looks as you would expect it uh, underwater, right? So you saw those fisheye imageries, they're fairly heavily distorted as you reach the extreme of the image. And the sort of ways around that, or the way that you sort of buy yourself out of those problems is, is typically by gathering a, a series of images such that the effective resolution in any uh, part you care about on the ground can be fairly high. 
but we've done everything from from fairly narrow field of view lenses so down to maybe never as narrow as 30 degrees but 45 degrees and bear in mind you lose field of view right when you go through the um, viewport right so if you have a 45 degree lens it's going to be narrower as you um uh pass through the interface to to the water but we'll do things from 45 degrees up to what you saw there which is i, I don't remember off the top of my head but it, you know closer to 180 degrees on the on the um uh, fish eye. maybe even higher so so i have kind of an off the wall question and, and it relates to your answer to sarah and that is um in some toad camera work that we've done we've actually gone to black and white cameras because mm -hmm. The problem of uh, of color distortion and whatnot, sure. um, and they tend to be higher resolution. Yep. So I'm wondering if there's a pot, a way to actually reconstruct the color ramp. You know, mm, and yep. black and white images. You know, maybe if you had some kind of color bar that you could standardize or something like that. Yep. Yeah. So yes. Uh, well, I'll, I'll give you two answers. So one, just speaking to the black and white camera. So the the reason you're seeing that typically is the cameras we deploy, the machine vision cameras that you would probably deploy on a toad camera. The color ones are going to be bare pattern for the most part, which means that they have etched into the new lens uh, an R, G, and B pattern. So effectively, you're you have a quarter of the effective resolution because you are reconstructing from a pattern of four back to one color pixel. Uh, so a, a grayscale camera, a black and white camera doesn't have that problem, right? Like, so you have a higher effective resolution. Now you can get around this by just putting a higher resolution camera in there, but obviously then there are data problems and you have to deal with a huge volume of data. And so anyway, now to your second question, which is uh, perhaps uh, uh, even more interesting. Yes, people have been doing reconstruction of color from black and white imagery. Now the challenge is that, uh, you know, you're missing the data, right? Like you, you, you simply haven't observed it. And so the way that that typically works terrestrially is that these deep nets get really good at what we call colorizing imagery because they've seen tons of examples of things. So uh, networks now can actually take a black and white image of a street scene and make the trees green and the bark brown and the road asphalt colored and the cars, uh, essentially a distribution of normal car colors, so red, blue, green, whatever. Uh, the challenge is that those are really, really highly structured scenes. So the one issue you face in the water context is, you don't, if you don't know what you're going to be seeing, uh, the ability to know what you saw and to reconstruct it can be quite difficult. And then the other thing I'll say just on that axis is that um, a thing that we've been looking at, and I, I would highly recommend, if depending on what you're looking for, is to think about multispectral imagery and even hyperspectral, Im well, less hyperspectral, but multispectral imagery, where you, you know, say, I'm going to be interested in these bands, and it's more than just RG and B, you know, I'm interested in these bands. And particularly if you're looking for biological organisms, there can be quite a bit of advantage there because they tend to, you know, if you're, if you're bringing light, they tend to only reflect in these sort of, um, various parts of the color spectrum. But yes, uh, so yes, you can reconstruct things, but not if you don't know what you're looking for and have never seen it before. It's really hard in those contexts. I don't know if that helps. It does, actually. <laughs> Any other questions for Matthew? Any more online? Uh, if not, we'll give you back a few minutes of your time. Really, it was great to chat. Yeah, really, really appreciate the invite. And, uh, um, you know, I always love talking about underwater stuff with people. So uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And thanks again for inviting me. Interesting stuff. Yeah, yeah really, really awesome. You know, I'm